or forever is a long time. And isn't it amazing that we serve an eternal God? So forever is not a problem for him. Uh, he doesn't operate in time. Time is God's way of allowing us to keep up with him. But he is the one who was and is and is to come. To him, a day is but a thousand years. And a thousand years is just but one day. So I thank God that he allows us to love him in time. But he loves us eternally. And what you represent as you sit here and those of you all who are watching us, who are so fortunate to be in commitment. Today's message is designed to get us to understand that we could never love each other properly if we don't find how to love God correctly. It is impossible to love a person if you don't love him. The scripture says, how can you love a God whom you've never seen, but you cannot love people who you see daily. I thank you for those of y'all who've made it through the struggle, who've triumphed through hell and high water, who've been to the Red Sea and back, climbed out of your pits, escaped from Potiphar's house, escaped the arrows, the dangers, as the old church would say, the toils and the snares. And you've made it. From the rest of us, we say thank you for your example. On this Valentine's Day, we wanted to celebrate love in a most auspicious way. And today, we're just kind of unorthodox. You've heard me scream before. Today, I want to see if you can hear me think. I want to see if you can hear me talk. But I will use the Word of God because I believe that the Word of God is definitely a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And I want you to go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 12. And this may be a little unorthodox. You may say, Pastor, what in the world? I know my Bible, and what does Hebrews 6 and 12 have to do with Valentine's Day? Well, maybe nothing at all. But today we're not celebrating a day. We're just talking about love. And isn't it true the Bible says that God is love? So when you're talking about love, you're actually talking about God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, he says, and I'm reading in the King James Version of the Bible, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. It is my prayer today that by the time we finish this discourse, that I would position you to inherit the promise. To inherit the promise. And God has promised each and every one of you something that you have not seen before. Eyes have not even seen. Your ears, they've never heard the good things that God has in store for you. Because you, my brother, you, my sister, in fact do love the Lord. That ye not be, everybody say, slothful. But everybody say followers of them who through faith and patience inherit, everybody say, the promise. Guess what I want to talk about for the next few moments? I want to talk about that lazy love. That's what I want to talk about. Let's talk about lazy, lazy love. You know, there are, um, and and. I'm sure you've heard of this before, so this won't be new information. How many of you all, by a show of hands and raise your virtual hand, have ever heard of the seven deadly sins? Right? You've heard of them? There's, there's a phenomenon. Now, let me go on record because most of the time when you hear somebody say the seven sins, the seven deadly sins, they'll, they're looking for a scripture where God says these are the seven deadly sins. It's It's theatrical. Uh, it's theoretical. It's not absolutely prescribed by God, but throughout Christendom, um, when we look at the scripture as a whole in its totality, these are the seven things that we see over and over again that cause uh, upheaval in the lives of people. It's almost like in the world, you have the seven wonders of the world. In the scripture, you have these seven 
deadly sins. And, and let me give them to you if you're taking notes at home. I'm going to give you the seven deadly sins uh, that the scripture speaks about. Number one, the first one, uh, and this one goes before the fall. You, can you guess it? Pride. Pride, is, it's the first one. And, and if you look at pride, it's spelled P-R-I-D-E. Here's one of the things my old professor told me. He said, anytime you get to a word where I is in the middle, you're already in trouble. P-R-I-D-E. How do you spell sin? S-I-N. Anytime I gets in the middle, you've got a problem. Secondly, greed. That's the second deadly sin. Number three, wrath. It's, it's that anger um, that, that is caused by someone else's actions. Number four is envy. Number five, lust, gluttony, slothfulness is the last one. Now, when I read those, how many of you are watching online and perhaps those of you who are in the room today in your relationship, maybe not all of them, but you've had pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, slothfulness, something like that. If, if you've had any of those in your relationships, just raise your hand or your virtual hand. If you can't say man, just say ouch. Brother Walker, when I read this, it shocked me that one was different than the other. That when I read this, that the first six were the result of too much of something. And the last one is the result of not enough of something. What, what is pride? Pride is when you have too much love and appreciation for yourself. And the Bible says pride comes before the fall. Greed is when you have too much of a desire for something. Wrath is when you have too much anger. Because the Bible says be angry and sin not, which means that being angry is not the sin. It's having too much of it and what you do as a result of it that recall that causes the sin what's envy wanting what somebody has too much what's lust it's an overzealous feeling for something that perhaps is off limits what is gluttony too much food but what is slothfulness not enough N not enough energy not enough motivation and, and when I think one of the poets said it, uh, when you get to the aisle, they tell you about the happy, but they don't tell you about the ever after. They tell you that, that, you know, when you have the wedding and all of you have been there, all of us have been there. If you've been down that aisle, the lust of the moment, uh, it starts from a child, from a woman, she's dreaming about the dress. She's dreaming about the moment that she will walk down the aisle and somebody will say, here comes the bride. You've got to understand that at that moment, it's two separately different things because the woman has gotten to the altar because she's getting ready to start her life. She's getting ready to start her life. She sees falling in love with this gentleman. She sees children perhaps coming uh, after that, she sees the house that she wants. She sees making this house a home and the family institution. Am I right, ladies? It's, it's about starting. And at that very moment, whatever the latitude and longitude is of that moment, wherever you are, the woman is thinking about something starting and the man is standing there facing you thinking about the end. He's thinking to himself, well, I've done everything I need to do. I've tried everything I need to try. I've dated everybody I needed to date. This is the one that I'm picking. And here you are standing next to somebody believing something is starting, standing next to somebody who's thinking something is ending. At the same place, at the same point in time. And, 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 and here we, we look at this scripture and we've got the seven deadly sins. And, and, and let me tell you, in every relationship, and I don't care if it's romantic or not, it could even be with a parent and the child, pride gets in the way. Yes. Envy can get in the way. Don't, don't be mistaken 
about how many men are in their homes envious of the attention that their children get from their wife. You've you got to understand that all of these things are there. You've you got to understand that even though you are married and, and, and relations should be a part of the relationship, you would be surprised at how many husbands and wives are still dealing with lust. And, and that thing that says that because we are married, we're supposed to be true to one another. And while that is true, nobody tells you at the altar that just because one person turns you on doesn't mean that everybody else turns you off. Don't, don't get quiet. It's true. It's true. It's true. I know you may not like it, but you are not the only attractive person your mate has ever seen. That they don't all of a sudden marry you and the whole world turns ugly. It's, it's about a commitment that, that, watch this, here it is. What marriage is, it is not perfection. What marriage actually is, is the ability to manage the original decision. That I decided to love you for better or for worse. And divorce is the result of people who don't have great management skills. It's not that they're not good people. It's not that they're not great individuals. It's that at some moment they became a bad manager. A bad supervisor, something entered. And I don't know if it was greed, and I don't know if it was pride, I don't know if it was envy, I don't know if it was lust, but it is the result of somebody who could not manage the original decision. Hebrews chapter 5, which is the chapter, Brother Adams and Sister Adams, that precedes the one we're talking about. Go back and read it, I know you will. Look at verse number 11. Here's what the writer's addressing. He's talking to people, watch this, who have what he calls Sister Johnson, dull hearing. If there is anything that is problematic for a relationship, it is dull hearing. How many times have you gotten in an argument or in a fight because you didn't feel that they heard you? One of the poets said it. I told you they were using my words. She said, I, I know, I know I hear you, but are you hearing me, I understand you. That's not why we're arguing. We're arguing because you don't understand. Anybody going to talk to me? I, I, know, I know you're at home. I can't hear you, but I can feel you right now. I, the problem, because I know I'm talking good because, because I know that if it's in my mind, it must be meaningful. So the problem is not me because if I thought it, it's a great thought. I understand me. The problem is you don't understand me. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is... This is, this is why you're nudging your spouse in the house right now saying, are you listening? This is, this is why you're thinking right now, oh, I cannot wait to pass to finish this sermon because I'm sending this link to Jared right after the sermon. Sarah needs this message. You're thinking about somebody right now, and I know that is the truth, but he says, he says, I'm addressing your dull hearing. And here's what he says. I want you to read it. I want you to open your Bible right now. I want you to go to Hebrews 5 and 11 because there's a word right there. And here's what he says, and this is every couple's understanding. He says, we have much to say about this. But it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. How many of you want to leap out of your seat and just leap for joy? I would tell you what's on my mind, but I don't think you would try to understand. I would tell you how what you said made me feel, but I don't think you would try to understand. I would tell you why it is hard for me to get over that. But I don't think that you are trying to understand. And I think that when a lack of understanding meets dull hearing, there is a lack of love. That hearing and understanding are necessary for growth. How can they hear unless they have a preacher? And how can he preach? Unless he be sent. Well, if he's sent, he has to hear. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The writer of Hebrews, and I wish we knew who he was because all of us need to send him a love offering. But we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Some say Paul. Some say Apollos. We don't know who wrote it. But we do know that whoever wrote it was divinely inspired by God. So much so that the writer of Hebrew got to write about other writers. He 
who wrote, or she who wrote, whoever wrote Hebrews, I'm telling you, they must have been somebody to write about Enoch, to write about Moses, to write about Sarah, to write about Abram or Abraham, to write about all of the great cloud of witness, those who are apart and the progenitors of our faith. This writer says, I would try to explain myself to you, but I'm afraid that you are not trying to understand. Am I talking to anybody who will admit that God is not silent? He always speaks. But maybe at some point, due to fear, hurt, and pain, you no longer tried to understand. The writer of Hebrews senses that the Christians of this day, and you have to understand that theologically where you are, this is a cross-section between Judaism and Christianity. And the Jews, whose original religion was Judaism, because of Paul and others who have infiltrated the Roman Empire and Asia Minor has now told them about a Jesus Christ who has liberated them from Judaism and now has introduced them to Christianity. And watch this. They have been converted and thank God for the conversion. Thank God for the conversion because the only way you can stay married is you have to be converted. The only way you can stay happy is that you be converted. It doesn't matter if you grew up in poverty and you grew up watching your parents get abused. If you're going to make this relationship work, you have to be converted from your orientation. It doesn't matter if they used to yell in your house. If this thing is going to work, you have to be converted. It doesn't matter if they stayed out all night. Maybe your father never came home, but that woman you with right now, if you're going to be with her, you have to be converted to a curfew. Help me, Holy Ghost. But here was the problem. The problem was not that they were converted. Paul says to them over in Acts, and, he's, and the writer of Hebrews says this in, in the book that we're reading. He says the problem is not that you have not been converted. He says the problem is, is even though you are now Christians, you are still practicing Judaistic rituals. He says that even though you've been converted, you still have rituals. And in every relationship, the problem isn't that you hooked up. The problems are your rituals. The problems are, are the things that you still practice that you said you would no longer practice when you met this person. The problem is the things that you still do. That last argument you said you would never do again. The problem is, is that you're still practicing the things in wartime that you said you would never do in peacetime. And he says, I am having a problem. Watch what he says. He says, I am observing you and you are still, watch this, practicing what he calls the baby things of Judaism. How many of you all will admit this? Holler at your boy at home that every once in a while you act like a baby. <laughs> Nobody going to talk. Well, well, how, what, what do you mean? I don't Google Gaga. No, but you cry until you get your way. You manipulate the situation until you get your way. Anybody won't admit that sometimes you practice the baby things. You, you pout, you stick your lip out, you walk into the other room, you get in the bed, you face the wall, and you put a line, just don't touch me. Just You get up and you go into the other room, and, and, and watch this, you get up and you go into the other room, not because you don't want to sleep with your spouse, but you really want them to come up and come into the room. And since you did the baby thing, you left so that they will follow you. They didn't follow you. So you concluded it must not be love. Because love for you means something different than it means for them. For some people, love means a gift. For some, love means physical touch. For others... It means words of encouragement. For others, it means acts of appreciation. So the truth is, most of us suffer is because we are great at loving people the way we need to be loved. But we're no good at loving people the way they need to be loved. And I would that if this sermon has resonated with you, 
I wish I had the number of every one of your haters. I wish I had the phone number or the email of every person who has ever come up against you because you don't have all of this together. And I would tell them for you, don't judge my brother. Don't judge my sister, because when when the writer was talking to these people who were on the threshold of Judaism and Christianity, he says, listen, you're dull of hearing and I still see you practicing the rituals of your history, because the truth is every person looking at me today has something in their life that they are prone to return to. I know you're a deacon. I know you're a praise team member. I know you're a manager at the bank. I know you have a master's degree. I know you're educated. Maybe you went to a historically black college, or maybe you're Ivy League, or or perhaps you just got summa cum laude in in the school of hard knocks. I I know know you got it all. I know you got it all, but but, but underneath your your pretty hair and your your pretty brown skin and your pretty brown eyes and and your Prada and your Gucci, you you got an insecurity. And, And if it's touched in the right place, everybody has something that they'll return to. Everybody has an attitude that if you make me mad, I don't care that I have the ability to speak properly. You want this ghetto, I'll give it to you because everybody has something that they can return to. Everybody has something they can return to. I I know we live in the suburbs, but I came from the streets. Everybody got something that they can return to. And I know there's at least 2,000 women that look at that man and say, Please don't try me. I've been fighting my brothers my whole life. Don't get it twisted. I'm soft, but if I go crazy, I might not win the fight, but you will look like you've been in one. Any women in here know what I'm talking about? Everybody has something. Don't clap too much, ladies. Everybody has something. <laughs> and I wish you could see uh, those people in here with us this morning. They, they, just, they just gave God praise uh, on Valentine's Day. Nonetheless, everybody has something that they're prone to. To return to you might have a jar full of quarters for every time you prevented yourself from cursing but but if somebody pushed the right button uh, you you'll talk in ways that that even Jesus won't recognize because everybody has something everybody got a habit that that if you feel unloved you'll return to everybody has a type of person that if they're not healed they return to. Everybody has a financial hang up that if shopping is therapy and you feel a certain way, you'll return to it. Why am I talking about this? Pastor, what do you what do you what do you have us here this morning for? And why are you sitting in that seat? Is it because you're tired? No. So I wanted to talk about lazy love. And I wanted you to know that according to the scripture, there is a difference. Between the lazy and the slothful. That they are not the same. Because laziness can actually be understood. If you are a single woman and you're in school and you're raising three, four, five kids and you're being a good wife and lover to your husband and you're cleaning up the house, and you're managing his family because he's no good at remembering his sister's birthdays, and you are the planner, and you are the babysitter, and you are the cook, and you are the cleaner, it is plausible that 9 o'clock at night and he comes home full of energy, you're going to be lazy because by the time he gets energized, you are ready to start your day tomorrow. If you don't eat properly in the day, malnutrition can cause you to be lazy. It's, it's, I mean, when you do a lot, see, laziness is when you don't have the energy to do what it is that you have the responsibility to do. Are you listening to me? It's, it's, it's when I have responsibility, but I don't have energy. It's, it's when I have responsibility, but I don't have drive. Laziness could be understood. It could be because of sleep deprivation. If you're only sleeping four or five nights a week for some of you all, or maybe three a night, 
it's no wonder I don't feel like doing so. I don't feel like reading the Bible. I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like rubbing your head. I don't feel like running your bath water. I don't feel like putting a mayonnaise on your sandwich. Here, take this turkey and this cheese. I know it's dry, but you won't be hungry. I don't feel like it. And it don't mean that I don't love you. It just means I'm lazy. And yes, I'm lazy because you have not taken into account how many things you've asked me for. And let me tell you something about a man. We don't ask for everything verbally. So the fellas, we don't give women enough credit because they are following. And I know you won't be honest with me, but they are following our silent commands. I'm going to take a circle on that one. I'm going to take a circle on that one because we got silent commands. We got stuff we require that we don't ask for, but we got a look that we give them when they don't meet the silent command. So, so you got the silent command and the verbal. And you call her lazy. And she may be. But there is a difference between being lazy and slothful. She may be lazy because she's stressed. He, he may be lazy, ma'am, because he's stressed because what you didn't see is that when he left the house after you celebrated him, everybody at his job tore him down and, and the person at the job didn't respect him. And, and then when he left there and his supervisor didn't respect him and then all of the people he supervises didn't respect him. And by the time he got home, he wanted to be celebrated and then he got home and the dog didn't respect him. He got home and, and he sees how the children foul out of the bedroom when you walk through the door and they come out of the kitchen screaming, mommy, when you walk in the room. But when he walks in the room, everybody just waves. Hey, when he walks in the house, he's looking for, for everybody to celebrate him as he walks in. But, but you call it doing cartwheels. And, and now he has to settle for a laissez-faire welcome into a home he built. That, that's why he's lazy. He's lazy because he's not celebrated. He's lazy because he's not appreciated. He's lazy because he thinks his only job is to protect and provide. And as long as he's protecting, as long as he's got a gun, and as long as he's providing, and as long as he's got money, he feels like all he is is a distribution center. And after he finishes serving you, he's got to go serve his mother. And after he serves his mother, he's got to go serve his sister. And after he serves his sister, he's got to go serve his cousin. And everybody wants, 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 wants from him but nobody gives 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 from him because men are known to be givers but not expected to want to be receivers we're always giving we're giving we're giving women even when you don't know we're giving while you're asleep at night, we're walking the floors trying to investigate sounds, trying to find out if the doors are locked, if the windows are closed. We're doing all kinds of things, wondering how are we going to get that dress that the computer has showed us that you've been looking at over the last three weeks? And how are we going to buy the shoes that we keep hearing you hint about, but you ain't asked about? Because you got silent commands, too. Is this all right? But I want to talk to the sloth in you. Because everything that I just talked about, it's understandable. It's, it's cool. It's a part of life. Sometimes you don't feel like it. Sometimes you don't want to. Sometimes you don't have the energy. And all of that is understandable. And let me tell you, God ain't mad at you. But to the slothful. To the slothful, to the side of you, watch this, because one is I have no motivation. God says, that's fine. We can deal with that. I don't want to deal with that today. I want to talk to those of you who've lost motivation. In the, in the Greek, the word sloth is, is no thrust. It means, watch this, it means someone who is willing to move. But not at the same pace they used to. <laughs> this is going to be good if you listen. I'm willing to meet your needs. But while I'm meeting them, I'm going to act like I don't want to. I'm going to show up. But you best believe I'm going to have an attitude on my face so you'll know I didn't want to show up. I'm going to do 
what you ask me to do, but I'm going to complain the entire time. It's movement without the aggression that you once had. It's the lack of drive. It's the lack of intensity. It's when you do it, but you want the other person to know that you are disinterested. And God says, I would you be hot or cold. But what bothers me is when you do it and you are lukewarm. What bothers me is when you go all out but act like you're in the middle. It's, 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 it's the part of you that does it but is disinterested. So the writer says that God is desiring that we quit being slothful. He's saying quit acting like someone who has lost their enthusiasm and excitement and has now sunk into a state of being sluggish and uninterested. It is what I am calling lazy love. Either be hot or be cold, but don't be lukewarm. If you're going to do this thing called love, whether it be for God or whether it be for your loved one or whether it be for your children, you've got to do it with everything you have because slothfulness has has nothing to do with energy. It has to do with condition. A lot of us are trying to do a good thing, but we're in a bad condition. I want you to ask yourself a question. What condition am I in? Am I still recovering from the last argument? I know I told you I forgive you, but can I really tell you? still hurt and I'm not like you just because you can get over it in two hours doesn't mean I can it takes me some time I'm I'm or, or I'm not like you I, I, I'm not going to be mad all week long I'm done with it the moment I'm done with it and there is the problem it's just because you're done doesn't mean we're done it's it's lazy love it's it's I've heard you so much. You said the same thing so many times. I'm not trying to understand. I've got dull hearing because I've heard you complain about that before. I've heard you say that before. I've developed dull hearing. Not that I don't love you, but it's just lazy. I'm, I'm not even trying to understand. Um, a, a slothful, here it is, a slothful person, uh, it's, it's, when, it's when you look like you're going somewhere, but inwardly you're stuck. It's, it's when it looks like you're going somewhere, but inwardly you stuck. So might I, over the next few moments, tell you how you can know if you are slothful? Because up until now, you've probably been vacillating, going back and forth and saying, sometimes I'm a sloth and sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm lazy. Can I tell you how you know you are one? Number one, the first way you know you are a sloth is you are a person who makes soft choices. Soft choices, indecisive. I, I, got a, I got scripture for you, and, and, and Sister Johnson, Sister Walker, I'm going to give you scriptures all the way through this so that you can use these against Billy and your husband. All of, I, want you to, I want you to have all the power you can when you get home. I, I promise you they're not going to like it after this, but, but I know what the power is. Help me, Holy Ghost. And, and so I'm going to give you these scriptures, and then I'll corral them later on and tell the brothers like we normally do. You know I was talking to you, bro. <laughs> so that's, that's how we do it. So, so look at this, Proverbs 6 and 10. Proverbs 6 and 10. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. And thy want as an armed man. Listen to me. One of the side effects of slothfulness is poverty. Treasure follows Aggression. Brothers, if you want to provide for your house and you want God to bless you financially, don't start with an application at a new job. Don't start with a million dollar idea and don't finish it. Bring aggression to the dream you already have and watch resources come knocking your door down. God says it's not that it wasn't a good idea, it's that you are lazy about it. 
is that you didn't give it your all. And poverty comes to the sluggard. When you look at people and you say, oh my God, they are, they are not good morally. They're not believers. How do they have what they have? It's because money is not looking for Christians. It's looking for aggression. Oh my God. Ladies, on top of being equally yoked with a man, make sure he's just not a Christian. Make sure he's got drive. Don't just look for somebody who's cute. Look for somebody who knows how to make a choice. I know I'm preaching, whether you, whether you like it or not, because many of you all have strong, cute, beautiful people in your life, but they're lazy and have no drive, and poverty will always find your house because it's a lazy love. It's a lazy love. I got scripture. Choose ye this day. You can't even get God without a choice. God says, I won't even go to somebody who won't make a choice about me. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. I will never bring stability to somebody who can't make a choice. Making a choice will keep you from burning up. Ask the Hebrew boys, choose you this day. Either you're going to bow or either you're going to stand. And they chose to stand. At least they didn't bow and stand. They made a choice. And standing outside of the fire made them withstand what happened on the inside of the fire. Because I'm telling you, if you'll make the right decision out, it'll protect you when you get in. Everybody say this with me. Either bow or stand. Either bow or stand. Jeremiah said it this way. He says, as for me and my house, here's the choice. We will serve the Lord. If you're going to live with me, you got one choice, serving God. You'd be surprised what would happen in your marriage and in your life if you just made a choice. If you just got together and talked about it and came out with a decision, what are we going to do with this child? What are we going to do with this money? Instead of acting like it's just going to work itself out, I'm telling you that one of the ways you will know you are lazy in your relationship is that you will not make the commitment to make a choice. That's number one. Is that good so far? Is that helpful? If, if you're watching online, raise your hand and let me know if that's helpful because I don't want to be helpful. If it's not helpful, I'll stop right now. But I'm only telling you what God told me. And I don't speak to you as somebody who's read the scripture. I am speaking from experience of what the lack of aggression will do. And it's amazing for somebody who loves you to see you be aggressive about what you love and not aggressive about them. It's amazing what washing your car will do to a woman who you'll never spend time with. It's amazing, brothers, what playing your video game all day will do to your relationship when you can't have a 15-minute conversation. It's amazing what playing NBA 2K will do in your 2K1. Number two, how do I know I'm a sloth? Was that poetic? Was that good? You put the, the next time you use my stuff, would y'all please give me credit? Number two, how do I know I'm a sloth? I limit my vision to things I'm not afraid of. You need a Bible verse? Proverbs 26 and 13. The slothful man says, there's a lion in the way. There's a lion in the road. See, a sign of slothfulness in your relationship is when you are too afraid to face your fears. I don't care who you are. Everybody got something that they're afraid of. How many women, you got something to say to him, but you're afraid of how he's going to react. You're, going, you're afraid of how he's going to respond. And it's not that you're afraid of him. It's that you're calculated. I don't feel like hearing that today, so I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to... And not that you're afraid of him, but you, you, you just think, yeah, it ain't worth it because, you know, he going to go off and he don't try to understand and I'll just deal with it. <laughs> now, how many brothers? Now, I really want to tell her what I think about that, but I don't feel like her being mad until April 2027. 
So I just deal with it. Because a woman will remember not only the day you made her angry, she will remember what you were wearing when you made her angry. And if the sun was shining, if the wind was blowing, and she will remember that there was an ant crawling on the ground, dragging a potato chip in the midnight hour. And you better not know that that ant was there because that means you wasn't paying attention. The way you know you're a sloth is you're afraid to face your fears. What? 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 What shape would we be in if Jesus was afraid to face the cross? Where would you and I be if Jesus didn't say, I must needs suffer the cross? He made a choice to suffer, he made a decision to suffer. If Jesus had considered the consequences of the cross, we would not have eternal life. Moses was a lot of things. He was a stutterer. He was a murderer. He was a complainer. But why was he the emancipator? Because he wasn't a sloth. He would walk for 40 years if it was necessary. He would leave Pharaoh's house if God told him to. He would get retribution for a Hebrew being beaten by an Egyptian if he felt it in his spirit. He may have been a lot of things, but being a sloth was not one of them. He would face Pharaoh if he had to. He would face the Red Sea if he had to. He was a lot of things, but he was not a sloth. David was a lot of things. David was a whoremonger. He was a murderer. He was a liar. He was a cheat, and at times he was a bad father. But he wasn't a sloth because he would face his lion and his bear and his giant and his king. He was a lot of things, but he wasn't a sloth. And I can show you person after person who you can look at their morals and it would say to you that they shouldn't have made it. But how did they make it? Because for everything that they were lacking, at least they had drive to do what God told them to do. What God is saying that even though you cannot keep it together, can you at least hold together what I gave you? Can you at least still keep your drive for your original decision? Can you still do what I've called you to? No man who has ever put his hand to the plow and looked back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's fit. 